Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 299, that's 299. If it's your first time checking in, this is the number one culture and shooter podcast in the world, all things internet related, all things clothing, all things music, art, technology, all that good stuff, all in one place. If it's your first time visiting, of course, hit that share button on your podcast app, wherever you're listening to, leave me a little five-star review, people can find the show. And if it's your first time watching via YouTube, why not smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment if you've got any questions. So um, let's just get straight on into it because no point of wasting any more time and doing all that other nonsense. How's everyone feeling? We're all just trucking along here. I'm going to get my headphones all sorted out here. We're just all trucking along, trying to get things sorted, trying to make sure we're not in a bad situation, aren't we? Right? That's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to maintain some level of uh, sanity. Um, I found it a little bit more easier than most because I'm probably a bit of a, you know, undercover serial killer probably in that regard. I find um, extended periods of isolation very calming um very illuminating i have time to read i have time to think i have time to write you know that good stuff think about cool ideas but one prevailing thought has actually um penetrated my mind is that i think i've gotten a little bit too chubby you know over the last couple of weeks especially because of the abundance of carbohydrates i've been eating and my poor eating patterns of just waking up a little bit too late i woke up this morning and unfortunately some of the fold on my lower belly was kind of making the you know the waistband of your boxes it sort of made that fold over and that's always a big sign. When that starts to fold over, I was like, okay, cool. I've got to start getting a bit serious. So I'm running often, you know. I'm doing probably five, four, I'm probably running three to five times a week, which is good. But obviously, as most of you guys are aware, that, you know, if you train, you know that most of the gains that you get is mostly down to your nutrition and partly down to your sleeping patterns. So if you can sleep enough and get some rest, you'll be fine. But if you can't, it becomes a little bit more of a struggle. So in order to return some level of parity and to get back to where I need to be, I think I'm going to enact some sort of changes daily rituals, which I've kind of scoped from this book that I have. I've got this a while ago. I think it might have been one of the first books that was recommended via Tim Ferriss's book club that he used to do. That I think he stopped doing it for a while, but he did like a little book club where you send out an email or write a blog post um, about a book that he thinks everyone should read. You will get it at a certain particular time, and then I'm assuming what happened was that you're meant to follow up and go back to the blog write a comment or a review on what you thought the book was or what, how the book impacted you in some sort of way and some of the recommendations were really good and as per usual Tim Ferriss is a smart dude so he always recommended good books but this is specifically something that I thought was um, very of use and kind of opened my mind up as to like the this I think came along you know what it's a weird analogy but this came this probably came at the same time that I was wondering whether or not where I was kind of skeptical about futures drug use and the weekend or some some of those kind of people i was thinking you know what i'm not too sure these guys actually live their raps or live their songs because i know at that moment in time i was just getting started doing my club promoting i was djing quite often um i was just out and about doing the damn thing and i realized that even i couldn't keep up that level of pace doing the minuscule thing that i was doing right? i'm not creating albums i'm not having interviews on radio shows i'm not flying all, all around the world performing in front of hundreds of thousands of people i'm just some minor guy doing you know little parties here and there and hanging out and trying to be cool and i couldn't handle it so i went to myself, I went to myself you know what i don't think what these guys are saying is true i don't think they actually do the things that they talk about in their raps or if they do they don't do them to the extent that they're promoting it's obviously some kind of you know it's tempered in some respects and of course you know it transpires that future well you know especially with the passing you no know, pre-juice world passing and post-juice world passing you he seems to feel a little bit more remorseful as to the things that he was promoting because he doesn't actually do as much as he you know says in his raps he still probably does something but doesn't do as much as he says and um this book really kind of um laid that to bear because essentially it follows the life of what it says um uh, i'll read a little bit of it to you here it says no, it's not so good, it's not so good, but essentially what you've got is an entire book full of some of your favorite no, so this is it. So it would be good. Yeah. So this is an inside little synopsis. It says here, um, Anthony Trollope wrote three three thousand words every morning before heading off to his job at the post office. Toulouse Lotri did his best work at night, sometimes um, even setting up on his easel in brothels. And George Gershwin composed at the piano in pajamas and a bathrobe. Freud worked sixteen hours 
a day, but Gertrude Stein would never uh, could never write for more than 30 minutes. And F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in Ginfield Burst he believed alcohol was essential to his creative prowess. From Marx to Murakami to Beethoven to Bacon, daily rituals examines the working practices of more than 160 of the greatest philosophers, writers, composers and artists ever to have lived. Filled with fascinating insights on the mechanics of genius, entertaining stories and the personalities behind it, daily rituals is, is irresistibly addictive and utterly inspiring. So, You've got that as a premise, and essentially each page has like an, a chapter a, 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 that it was dedicated to. Like, so here you have Margaret Mead, right, on one page, and then it kind of details exactly who they are, gives a bit of background, and then kind of go, goes right into like their daily ritual, what they did, did they wake up early in the morning. And what you see by reading this is that most people had some level of structure. There are the odd kind of, um, um, there are the odd um, exceptions here and there, I assume, but for the most part, everyone has some kind of structure that they kind of do that they kind of uh for them to get their best work done and i guess in these kind of testing times it can be difficult to i don't know because some people are worried about other things right you're not really got the motivation to get up at five or six in the morning to go for a run or to sit down and write or to take some pictures i know but if you can have any kind of structure i think if you're working at home it should be better but i guess if you're on furlough it's probably difficult because you've got nothing to do you're just twiddling your thumbs and if you're out of work you're probably the same so that can be difficult but if you have obviously an occupation and you're doing it at home it could be a little bit easier you know you can kind of structure your day around the work that you do during the day and then you have some activities before you start and then after you start and then after you finish sorry that could be an assumption but i'm going to do that for the next couple of weeks happening now especially until the end of the month um i need to kind of lose a couple of pounds to make sure that i'm running at the necessary speed um i'm probably not going to do any fasting or anything i'm sorry for my shirt here but who cares i'm probably not going to do any fasting or anything just make sure that i avoid all the nonsense stuff don't eat at ridiculous times because you end up spending too much time at home and it when you're indoors too often you end up kind of dipping into things that don't necessarily aren't necessarily that um important at the time but anyway let's get going um let's start this podcast again get it all nice and fresh and going as per usual i've got some stuff on here i want to speak to you about loads of internet stuff i thought was interesting and everything else in between so strap on in and get with it so number one is this amazing video that i'm sure a few of you have probably seen um it's an epic story or it's an epic video to be fair and it's not really a story because i don't really know the truth of the matter i think there's an actual article that i'll read in a minute that actually explains what actually happened but this video i think was oh shared on the monday i think i'm gonna say maybe on monday and it's you know it's gone viral since then it's got fifteen thousand. this is the obviously not the original but the original was shared by somebody else i think it's been shared you know because i think with twitter you can share the video itself on your profile and then that kind of adds to the numbers um but essentially this clip this random dude took where he kind of explains it in the subtext says this clip i posted yesterday has been going viral all over fb and ig essentially i think he was walking by and he just heard you know the fire alarm go off in this building apartment or in this i don't know if it's a motel or if it's apartments but whatever it is the scene just opened with two good dudes on the balcony and one door open and there's water just gushing out this is people listening to the podcast right water just gushing out the front door and somehow you know what transpires next is just beggar's belief really it's just an absolute horror show from the start to finish and if anything it's a good representation of just why i'm so in love what i love you know public freak out videos so i watch quite a lot of them um, there's always something whenever you, if you see me watching a video on my phone you always hear some sort of screaming some sort of shouting someone's shouting while starting the background because i don't know there's something about the human condition that draws me to that right just seeing the pure and utter carnage some humans get up to all around the world and the fact that there's a common theme behind it right or that ties it all together just a whole bunch of crazy people in different locations all around the world just acting fucking crazy on the internet for our entertainment you can't you know you can't be saying anything bad about it so let's just start the video here fuck is going on and this nigga come out so wet so the doors i'm i'm assuming again for my layman's expression i'd assume something happened in that apartment building where he probably fucked around with the sprinklers and um i remember watching that it must have been one of the you know when you're on a random youtube hunt and i remember watching something about fire um the fire brigade some of their common calls that they have to go out to and then i think this is one of the ones that are at the top and obviously you've got the whole cat in the tree thing but the one thing that they get inundated with is people kind of letting off sprinklers um in apartment buildings and 
they were saying the amount of water that actually comes out of a sprinkler you have no idea about in it and but it's stranger because i think it's in california so they're, they're, they're quite stringent with the amount of water that you use they like people to kind of turn for taps and that sort of shit but this is just absolutely gushing out of this apartment so i'm assuming everything in the actual um, apartment itself is probably destroyed like, whoa, whoa, what's so suddenly, it's, it's all wet and then out of nowhere the guy just jumps over the barrier so i'm assuming you know the person at the end of the of the staircase doesn't want to let him down but let's just run the video and see it anyway jumps in the car bang bump into the car body gets out and then somehow runs and then there's this girl in the background just screaming <laughs> <laughs> you hit a girl in the back. What the fuck is going on? What is this shit? What the fuck is going on? Oh my god. Who is freaking out? And of course, there's, there's, there's always that one hysterical. Obviously, the, the, little, the little kid I don't have any problem with, right? She probably looks like she's under the age of 12. Fair enough, let her scream and get all hysterical. But there's always one woman out there in the background that's always screaming, you know, get the police, someone call, someone call the ambulance, someone call the police. I have the, you know how Americans say police to the police, police. Um, or someone recording with their phone, okay, you record me, I'm going to record you. It's just a fucking bizarre video. I just, I, I, again, there's so many questions, so little answers. Why is there a cleaner there at that time of the day? I don't know. She's obviously looking at it thinking, I'm not going to clean that shit up, right? Then that guy jumping over, did, does he live in the apartment? Was he trying to rob it? He doesn't look like a, a, he doesn't look like he's trying to break in, right? He jumps, the funny thing is that he jumps over the barrier and he's still got, he's, he's still sagging his trousers, right? He hasn't necessarily tried to pull his trousers up, which is probably difficult to do once your trousers are soaking wet, but his trousers are still sagging. He's still, his hair is still quite, I think his hair is all right, isn't it? As he's coming down, no? oh my his hair looks all right <laughs> so so then i think i the next topic or the next um actual bit of news is that tmz find that found out what actually happened and provide some context in it just when you want some clarity and you want someone to come and uh let you know what happened tmz kind of provided some of the context behind it so this is the article from tmz it says the following here um flooded hotel viral video explained 10k in damages jesus christ so it says um this guy who ran out of a flooding hotel room didn't only ruin uh the nissan he jumped on of course yeah because he smashed up cut he smashed the roof and the sun and the front winch the front the front window or windscreen whatever it's called and the front bonnet so you know it's basically written off the car didn't he i'm assuming do you have the car no they're probably bits that you can replace quite easily um, the bizarre video started going viral on Tuesday and the backstory behind it just is nuts. According to the guy who captured the scene on video, the trouble started flowing uh, around 7 p.m. at Studio 6 Commerce in California. The person behind the camera, Prophet Amen Ra, Jesus, that is his actual real name. Fucking hell. Uh, wonder what color he is, eh? It tells us fire alarms, were, fire alarms were going off, but motel workers couldn't get into the room because it was locked. One staffer smashed the window to get inside, and once the door opened, the water started gushing out. Jesus. So, so I guess he was in there, right? And the alarm was ringing. So it says, now internet famous jumper escaped the hotel employer's grasp. Okay, so that guy with the muscle that was one of the people that was in the hotel, I'm assuming, and hopped over the railing to flee the second floor building by bounding down onto the Nissan Nora. Smart move. But those things, right, they always look a lot more achievable when you're up there. But then once you get, you know, when, when you're up on the other side, and once you get on the other side of the railings, it suddenly starts to become real. Like, oh, shit, it's quite high. Usually just what I found with heights. You can sometimes have a, De delusions of grandeur you can sometimes think you know what you can heighten sense of self you're like I, I can do this then once you step on it you're like mm, i probably can't so but for him it was too late he already had made a decision right once you get over the other side there's no going back you have to just go with it and un unfortunately for him because the water was gushing out the, the whole roof of the car was wet so then he has slipped but i think if it would have been any other moment he would have been okay to land on it and just jump off it would have been perfectly fine <laughs> Uh, the nine their famous jumper escaped and hopped on the railing to flee the second floor apartment down to a Nissan Murano. 
smart move. He hit the car, then to the hood with his ass, and then he smashed his head in the pavement. We told the motel workers claimed the jumper had turned on all the faucets in the room and also busted pipes to the ceiling. A total damage of 10,000. There goes his deposit. Of course, LA County Chief Fire County Fire and Chief Department were responded. Our sources say neither the car owner nor the hotel manager wanted to press charges, and the guy said he had no malicious intent. He claims the room was just flooded. How can a room get that flooded? So he so it wasn't even a fire sprint. So what alarm was going off then? That doesn't make any sense. Does that what it says in the beginning? Right? Yeah? Person to come said the fire alarm. So who? So I'm guessing somebody in a hotel smashed the fire alarms to get access to the room. But the room was already flooded. But why was the room flooded? Was there a sprinkler damage? Or did he leave? Why was he running the taps as well? But it's an absolute bizarre story. Oh, but it's a you know a sliver of sunshine, a sliver of humor in these dark times, man. But Jesus Christ, it makes no sense, isn't it? It doesn't make any sense. He's in a he's in an apartment building. He obviously lives there. And what? Why is he opening all the taps up? Maybe he's just geeking out, isn't it? He might have been high on meth or something. You know that that's kind of meth courage a little bit, no? Because I think when you're on coke or anything, you get a little bit paranoid, so you just hide behind the covers. But when you're in meth, it's supposed to be you tweak out and you start doing mad shit, right? You start scaling mountains and scaffolding and start, you know, trying to jump over drain pipes. So that might be part of it. He might have just felt like Superman. Um, or he just started washing his face and then he just left a tap on. I don't know. It's just a bizarre story, though. You can't explain crazy. I think I've got to stop doing that. I try and, I try and understand crazy too often. Maybe because I know deep down I have the possibility of turning into one of those crazy people but you just can't explain crazy sometimes some people are just you know they're just tiktoked as uh, tom segura says on his podcast your mom's house there are people so some people are just tiktok you can't help them out let's continue here some other good news uh jack dorsey has donated over one billion dollars of his uh wealth or yeah of his assets you know wealth right from square in order to fight um or in order to help with COVID nineteen relief and just be a generally a bit of a good dude, put some money into other, some other charities. And as per usual, you know, the internet responds and people are just scoffing at it, loads of naysayers coming out of the woodwork, which is which again I, I think it must be uh, the way you're raised, isn't it? Because I remember when I was younger, for the most part, where when I grew up, I, I was under I was given strong instructions, I was pointed in the direction of like, you know, only speaking on things that I knew about and sometimes not even speaking about those kind of things. But one thing you didn't do, you didn't involve yourself in other people's business. Like you didn't judge what other people did with their time or their money. It's none of your concern, right? Unless it impacted you in some way, shape or form. Of course, those things change, you know, maybe you get a bit older, you start getting a little bit embittered, life throws at you some challenges and you start to develop a bit of a chip on your shoulder. But by and large, most people i think are brought up in a home where it's not really encouraged to just you know throw stones at people trying to do something trying to make a change uh, trying to impact their community however flawed their logic or reasoning may be you just not something that you do it's just a little bit yucky but then there's some people who i think i don't know if it's because if they're rebelling against their parents being so controlling they don't they don't waste the moment to let you know that they disapprove of the thing that you're doing even though they would never do the thing you're doing given the chance and again we can't it's a broad stroke it's a broad assumption but you know fuck it, it's a podcast you might as well do that it makes it more fun but most people that have these kind of complaints would never do what they're what you know what someone like a jack dorsey is doing in his position because what people have to understand is that as you know there's some socialists that believe that you know people of wealth or people that have amassed uh, uh, loads of, especially especially people that not people that come from wealth even people that have amassed wealth you know over a short period of time they owe society something they need to give back but you know there's nothing in the law that says they have to give back morally they might have to for society they may have to for karmic value they might have to but there's nothing that's it, there's nothing that it's not like a required thing to do so when someone does it in my opinion i think when someone does do it it's a benefit it's you know it's similar to it's similar to like you know there's that thing where if you invite someone to your house for a dinner party, you half expect them to bring a drink, right? I think mean, this is different. I don't know how you guys are, but some people are the type of person to be like, hey, you send a text over all your friends and say, I'm cooking dinner, bring bring drinks, whatever you want to bring, right? It's just like a, a loose thing, a loose kind of suggestion that you're hoping is the central people in your group will bring drinks. Then there's some people who text the person directly and say, hey, make sure you bring a drink, right? And they'd fucking look at your hands, make sure you have drinks when you're coming in. If you don't, they turn you off, they turn you, they turn you around and tell you to go to an off license. Two different approaches, right? But the idea behind it is that 
you are doing one thing so that you're hoping that person can kind of reciprocate by taking the weight off the drinks off your shoulders and bringing them to the party now if somebody doesn't bring one and you just suggest it loosely my thinking about it is not to call them out once in my home i invite you in you eat you have a good time but you're never coming back again because i know what kind of person you are just based off that one little thing that you didn't do it's the same could be said for your billionaires right for all the trouble twitter's been in for all the stick jack dorsey's got over the years from social justice warriors from people on the left or people on the right um, people in between from conspiracy theories he's gotten it from everybody right no one really likes him really for the most part everyone thinks he's a bit of an evil cunt right for all the bad that he's supposed to be done to people's eyes he still feels the need to step back into the limelight because i'm sure he was aware when he comes out and says what he's going to do people are going to scoff at it but he decides to step back into the limelight and say hey by the way i'm going to do this i'm going to take a portion of my wealth that i've amassed through my hard work through my ingenuity through my genes and being born the right time and through my hard work and through the work of other people whatever he's how he amassed it it doesn't matter he has money he doesn't need to give it to you right and he's deciding to give it back to uh, various charities and in order to fight this you know pandemic is going on and affecting everyone around the world now it could be just because people in his family are affected with it that's why he's doing it It could be because he wants to it could be he, he want, he's only doing it because he wants to have a tax write-off it could be you know loads of number of reasons but does the reason actually matter if he's going to do something in that regard one billion dollars is one billion dollars really in it um so this is a tweet kind of announcing it and laying out the groundwork this happened i think the other day right so it says it jack says i'm, I'm moving one billion of my square equity 28 percent of my wealth to smart small llc to fund global covid19 relief after we disarm this pandemic the focus will shift to girls health and education and ubi it will operate transparently all flows tracked here and the fucking crazy nutter decided to put everything in a fucking google doc that's so silicon valley in it like he decides what he wants to do he makes a decision he gets a he gets the he uses the minimal viable tools in order to get the job done nothing too crazy no big press release uses his own platform he uses a google doc lays it all out there for you to guys to see what exactly is going on it's absolutely incredible that like he just put it all on the sheet but one thing it did wake up people about is like you know how much obviously he's worth because if one billion of 20 percent 20 percent of his wealth is one billion then you know he's you know he's got a couple coins in the bank but jesus christ i just i don't know maybe it's because everyone's going through tough times and they just want to lash out at someone but this isn't the people that you you can't give jack dorsey the same energy you're giving gal Gadot, right her singing imagine to us trying to make us feel better is a nonsense right she should be getting taken a piss out of all the time but for somebody of his stature for somebody of his notoriety again considering all the sticks that he's got all the sticks and stones he's had to enjoy over the last few years for him to kind of step back into the limelight again and say hey by the way here's here's a, here's a billion dollars to fight all these um in order to kind of uh boost all these charities and you know drive the initiative for universal basic income or something that everyone's been um um everyone's been fighting everyone's been kind of questioning and proposing and thinking whether it's a good idea and this is probably the best time for it right the conversation is probably right it's right for a conversation right now people want to have that combo about ubi i think i would you know it's something that i think would benefit a lot of people especially some of the people who kind of tie their entire identity at work maybe having the ability to pursue other interests whilst knowing you have a little bit of money coming into your account and then if you are the type a kind of person because i think you want impact type a's type a's will still find a way to keep busy they'll still find a way to you know to to work hard to burn the midnight oil they'll find a way so if you're allowing the people that aren't type a to do to have the ability to kind of take their foot off the gas a little bit bring up their kids uh take their kids to school uh, be there for their family learn a new hobby have a new interest build a business all those kind of things will actually help it's not going to make everyone just suddenly turn into you know um lazy bums it's not going to happen that way you don't you, you don't work all your life to suddenly then decide once someone gives you 900 pound a month you're suddenly going to take the fourth the gas it's not going to be enough it might last for a couple of months but then you're definitely going to pick up some extra work on the side and for companies it might be good too because you might have a very laser focused determined workforce right you've got this group of people who are all within there like let's say they've kind of all got kids they're all in mid 30s to maybe early 50s they all kind of got loads of experience they come in like assassins they work with you for six months three days a week they get the job done they don't need any training right 
Like that, that could actually work good for companies. They don't have to pay. They don't have to keep everybody on fucking full salary. You can have them on rolling contracts. Like it will be, it will be pretty good, I think, going forward. Um, but anyway, that's what one part of the tweet, and then he kind of lays out the entire program. He says, "Why UBI?" Um, and girls health education says i believe they represent the best long-term solutions for the existential problems facing the world ubi is a great idea needing experimentation girls health and education is critical to balance it i like that everyone's using the same sort of language i think i heard eric weinstein talking about um the need to uh potentially uh be multi multi-planetary species right maybe we've exhausted the resources on this planet which there's no kind of turning back the wheel in terms of some of the social and uh, social uh, social economic things that are happening at the moment and some of the politics as well that we need to kind of just go somewhere else right and you've got elon musk of course with his spacex program um trying to uh take you know people to mars um some of the point-to-point travel stuff like there's interesting shift i'm seeing happening with some of the four leaders in this platform everyone's talking about the same sort of thing and then next to here says um why is smart why is a smart small llc says um these this segments the and and dictates my shares to these causes and provides flexibility grants will be made from smart small foundation or llc directly based on the benefactory all goes okay all transfers and sales and grants will be made public on a tracking sheet which is that one i just mentioned to you there which is absolutely cool it says why the transparency he says it's important to show my work so i and others can learn i've discovered and funded 440 million many organization with proven impact and uh efficiency in the past most anonymously going forward all grants will be public suggestions welcome drop your cash app it says um why paul just from square and not uh twitter it says simply i own a lot more square i will need to pace the sales over some time and the impact this money will have should benefit but companies over the long term because it's helping people we want to serve the interesting thing there is that he doesn't own that much about twitter or twitter which is interesting which is which kind of makes more sense because i remember the story coming out that um he was having a bit of a power struggle with some of the board members at twitter they wanted to replace him with somebody else thought their leadership hadn't really progressed the platform that well the product development having had kind of stagnated and they went to get someone else in to kind of lead the ship and of course some most of the silicon valley heads who are og silicon valley didn't want him to go because obviously he's like you know he's a legend in the scene and shit but you kind of got the feeling that if he's being pushed out of twitter especially now when twitter's had this resurgence it definitely means he hasn't got as much sway or power that he wants or influence that he once had there before but maybe it's a good thing going forward because he's probably doing a lot more good for society with cash app than you would have done with twitter and twitter's a bit of a cesspool at the moment and there's no probably going backwards with that one and then to lastly he said why now he said the needs are increasingly urgent and i want to see the impact in my lifetime i hope this inspires others to do something similar life is too short so let's do something for everything we can to help people now that is amazing man so cool to see him of course andrew young saying thank you because he's a big proponent of ubi cool to see man i can't wait to see other people kind of respond to that what's what it takes really and because i guess for them as well because this is the thing people understand that you know the kind of social media economists imagine if everyone else jumps on it because they just want to be a part of what you know they want to get some clout from uh being philanthropists or for giving back to their local community is that a bad thing do you not want that as well or do you want the people that give to just be puritanical right to be pure to be uh saintly godly figures what do you want you have to decide in there because sometimes the money the funds or the ability to do certain things might come from places that you don't necessarily agree with philosophically politically um like you know what i mean they might oppose anything that you want but they might have some intentions that might align to you that you might need to get on top of so i don't know man i don't know but you know, good good look from jack dorsey in general i think that's going to be something that a lot of people are going to look forward to um going forward and seeing how that develops hopefully influence other people to do the same like i said especially ubi i'm interested to see how that develops because i reckon there's a lot of scope for that especially nowadays with everyone being furloughed or being let go from their companies and stuff let's move on oh um lucy k special absolute fire flame um so i watched lucy k special yesterday uh, it's called Sincerely Louis C.K. It's available now on his um, website. Check it out. It's like $8, which is like, what, I think like £6. Um, you can pay for it directly via his website. He's did this previously before with other specials. He kind of releases them directly on his website. Easy to easy to download. You just play them on most players. And I mean, I don't need to give you the backstory of Louis C.K. You know, he went through a little bit of a Me Too moment when Me Too was still in full swing. What's happened to Me Too now, right? People have kind of gone a bit quiet about that. 
especially nowadays, you know, people have more testing things to worry about than the power dynamics that, you know, mostly Caucasian held companies in the middle of Manhattan or somewhere, you know, no one cares. But anyway, Lucy K special is really good. Um, it's really good because it's honest, of course, it's what you expect. It's incredibly dark. Um, it takes you on a complete journey and he did a really good way. He did a really good way of kind of addressing everything without overly addressing it. He didn't turn it into a TED talk where he just lays bears the pains of being a man in Hollywood and how women have it easy. I thought he was going to go down that route. I really did. Um, but he didn't. He wasn't embittered. He kind of understood. He kind of, I kind of got the feeling he understood he was just collateral damage. Like it wasn't necessarily about him. He just happened to represent the patriarchy he was represented he was a representative um he was a sacrificial lamb in that respect right he had to go down because that story just came out and because the story was so egregious it sounded it, it sounded worse than what it actually was um people got their panties in a twist and they immediately cancelled him but then if you read between the lines or you dig a bit deeper especially listen to some comedian podcasts you hear that he was quite instrumental in propping up the careers of several women on the scene who didn't necessarily get any chances with any other with any other executive or producer especially female producers right because there's a lot of them out there but they don't necessarily go out their way to hire some of these writers that he was kind of having on board or that he was having tour with him or that he was having or that he was mentoring whether it was for his own you know um kinks whatever that's that that's by the by but i mean in terms of just helping people out he was a good guy to the friends that he liked right so people that he liked or people that were in his circle they got good looks so when that when he's when his life was you know pulled from underneath his feet and the netflix special was cancelled and his movie was i think i think they postponed it for a while then it went straight to dvd um he had a big movie coming out that was like shot in black and white i seem to remember uh then everyone of course that he worked with was out of a job too and i think he mentioned something along the lines of i think he said something like 30 million dollars or something he lost during that whole debacle he moved to france hooked up with a with a french uh comedian out there who he mentions in the special as well and just you know kind of felt as if like he was going to stop doing comedy and just kind of live a regular regular life then obviously some videos came not videos but some blog entries from uh, writers who were going around following him all around the world uh, when he popped up in comedy clubs and you know saying how threatened they felt about him being on stage and all that sort of theatrics and then i think a joke got out um, that he was testing or that he was kind of running through in a club about things school shootings it might have been during one of the school shootings in america and then that really kind of spiked that really kind of got everyone talking again about number one it got talking it got people speaking again about the merits of louis ck right the fact that he's always been that guy he's always been this dark guy even before what happened happened to him that he was you know he sounded like he was working at a joke he wasn't necessarily like he wasn't a complete joke he didn't uh smooth the edges off of it or anything and the reaction to it was quite silly and nonsensical and i think that might gave him a bit of encouragement that the people within the community within the scene were kind of backing him and championing him and then he kind of went quiet and then we announced a tour in all these random countries all around the world and he sold most of them out and he just felt as if like wow this dude is impenetrable right he's obviously one of the greats i think he's definitely top five in terms of like living comedians at the moment but he definitely showed a bit of appeal that he had in terms of the place he was able to book um, all around the world that he definitely had a bit of a pull still regardless of the scandal i think people could see through the scandal and say you know what he's always you know because if you watch some of his old specials you know he's always been a bit of a creep he's always been a bit of a pervert um so hearing a story about him doing whatever in front of these comedians didn't really seem like that big of a deal um and again i've been waiting for him to come back on the scene for a while this he's a kind of there's a kind of comedy i like um, it's the kind of perspectives I like. Um, it's very introspective. It's very dark. Again, very honest. Um, I won't spoil any of the jokes for you because, of course, you know that's not the thing that you do. But I really recommend you check it out. It's one of my favorites of recent years, and it's probably easily up there with Dave Chappelle's. Like easily up there, easily, easily. Definitely better than Chris Rock's of late, and maybe a few others. But Lucy K definitely put himself back on the market again. And I think he's do it before. He was he was very prolific in terms of always doing a special a year. Um, maybe it's because they travel because i think some comedians say you should do them every 18 months sometimes maybe longer because obviously you need to live a little bit you need to gain some kind of you know experience you need to travel be on a road um hear some stories um make some stories and then you start to kind of fine tune your act but he tends to really work at a prolific pace that might be due to the fact that he's you know at the time he was a uh, one of the hollywood elites 
but so he probably was writing a ton for other people meeting loads of people interacting flying all around the world so he had a ton of material to actually kind of lay bare but maybe now things are slowed down he might take a bit he fought the pedal a little bit but i don't think there's any point now he's got this is probably three years off of material all condensed into one special he's probably got loads of stuff he's probably doing now at the moment that's fresh and new he probably should, will be ready to put another special maybe by the end of the year if he wanted to so i can't wait to see what he does next um I like that he would provide a little press release about it saying that people will probably need a bit of a laugh now in these dark times and this is a rare time to drop the special and for me it definitely was it took me away from everything that's going on i turned off the news i sat down grabbed a cup of tea and watched louis ck so save louis ck available now on his website which is louisck.com check it out again i'll put the links below for you to see but definitely one of my favorite um specials of recent years and definitely puts him up there as one of the top five comedians on the scene Let's move on. Mm. Oh, it's a really cool interview actually with Future, which I thought was really cool. Which has, has some um, tie-in with um, a Dax J interview that I read. So Future's featured here in Double XL magazine where he learns to uh, where he learns to drive a yacht, which is you know very lavish. I'm not sure how they got the budget to do this, but fair enough to a double XL, but it's a really cool interview, loads of really interesting pieces. But one of the things I thought was really cool, which I'm gonna put up here. Let me see if I can see the bit that what bit that I mentioned. Yeah, this is a bit so we get here. It's a bit about upper kind of rappers. I think it's about juice in it, right? Juice, let's see if I can find it here. It says I did feel bad words over here. Yeah, so this is a bit that I thought was really interesting, right? So this interviewer sits down with Future and essentially talks to him about Juice World and the passing of Juice World and some other rappers and just saying how hard it is coming again. I thought Future's response was um, very insightful. It means that maybe he's growing as a person, but I don't know, maybe because it's a written interview, he feels a bit more comfortable, but he was very, he was a lot more open than he has been in other interviews that I've read or heard or watched of his. So here's the interview for Double XL. The question is as follows. With the loss of Juice, Nipsey and Excess Tentacion, Macmillan, Pop Smoke and others, it feels like we have lost more rappers than ever, from murder to drug overdose to illness. Do you feel like being a rapper is a crazy thing right now or like you've lost a lot of peers? He says, nah, because it's regular people that go to jail. I mean, regular people that live their life, they go to work. And if somebody walk in their job and just shoot them, they never thought they died from a gunshot. It's just randomly they happen to die from a gunshot. Rest in peace to anybody that ever caused... Uh, or ever went through that tragedy or ever went through that problem my heart goes out to them but at the same time it's like everyone dies from different reasons it's just so happened to be a rapper or something that they just died from this way and they shed a light on it and it's just like oh did rappers doing this is that epidemic with rappers overdosing and getting murdered it's the streets man it's the new streets it's the new wave it's the new stream which i definitely agree with and then this bit was very enlightening it says it's like a lot of rappers uh it's a lot, a lot more rappers than back 10 years ago so now a lot of things more are going to occur so it's true so there's more rappers so I think it will happen it's a lot of young yeah, rappers that are growing up super fast that's getting money super quick don't have classes on success they don't have guidelines on what they need to do when you get success or what to do when you get money how much sleep you're supposed to get how much water you're supposed to drink how many drugs you don't supposed to take it's like not a class there's no guideline on that you really have to maneuver on your own and become your own person or just got to be like your own boss. So everything that happens, it comes from you. You got to know when to give, when to give and you got to know when to let up sometimes and detox. You got to know when enough is enough because you control your own destiny and you don't want to self-destruct. Fucking really, really succinct, succinct um, response from Future. You didn't really expect that, and that's really true. I think there was um there was a bit of hysteria happening, especially you know that we've lost too many rappers, that's for sure. But you know, some of them, you know, some of the circumstances individually were really tragic if you look at the stories and stuff. But the drug overdose sort of thing to pin the blame on him specifically, I thought was a little bit unfair. I think you know for. You know, since the inception of music, people have been exploring, especially on the creative side of things. Artists have been exploring their creativity via uh, mind altering things, mind altering substances since the beginning of time, right? And it's still going to continue. It's part of the artistic journey for some people. Some people continue on it, you know, some people kind of uh, divert off it and decide to get sober and just tap into their creativity in other ways. But people have been exploring that, you know, since the beginning of time. 
and uh, there are going to be some children there are going to be some kids there are going to be some individuals that are going to be more susceptible to influence right they're going to give into it they're going to try these things and double into which isn't a bad thing either because part of the reason why brands align with rappers or artists is because they want the young and impressionable people out there who follow them to also be impressionable enough to purchase those things so it works twofold right if, if he's promoting mercedes um and, he, and then he talks about a liquor brand there's no difference he's going to influence somebody but you know obviously the the degrees and severity in terms of drugs and maybe alcohol you know there's a big difference there in that regard but i don't think you can place a blame on him that way but i think a lot of the blame needs to be made squarely le less at the peers in the, in the, in the inside industry and more so at the actual uh people that work within it the comp the record labels the production companies the agents the management teams they are the ones that should fall most of the blame and of course the family the person brought up in that's obviously um by the by but the record label needs to get more blame the record label needs to be have more scrutinized more in this regard because they signed these kids at 16 17 sometimes younger especially if you look at someone like little pump who got that's something people don't talk about too often he's lucky to go out of the deal but he got signed a record label deal you know when he was underage he did not know better the label the record label deal was you know completely screwed him over and luckily he was able to get out because he was a minor which is even you know shows how inept that record label is that they were able to sign a minor not know he was a minor think they could get away with it and then they didn't it's like you know wasted a whole lot of time and money in that one but i think more blame is he put on record label record label needs to have some kind of i'm not sure if it's a wellness center i'm not sure if it's a health and safety officer whoever it is there needs to be somebody there who's able to guide the artist through all the many pitfalls that they're going to encounter whilst they're kind of coming up in the scene and it always feels as if it happens in the beginning it always feels as if at the start of their career is when things get crazy especially after the first single pops it feels like when you get when you get the first single and you suddenly start appearing on ellen and you start going on jimmy fallon and you start doing npr or not MPS could be a little bit later down the line but you start to do more radio tv interview more radio um, interviews more tv interviews you just have to get yourself out there a bit you maybe have a spotify billboard out there that's when the um, influences start to or the negative influence start to come into your life you start to get all these hangers on coming in you start to build up a bevy of new friends you maybe fall out of a few people that you were hanging out with in the beginning it starts to get a bit murky especially in the beginning so i think that's the crucial place they need to be and a lot of them don't do that especially some of the management companies right they're eager to take their 10 their 5 10 15 percent off the person but they're not really eager to kind of help them out and make sure that they're okay mentally and physically and also there needs to be an honest conversation about what it actually takes to be you know obviously not everyone could be drake that's for sure not everyone can because he was kind of primed for stardom because he was a you know a childhood star a child a child actor by the way but before he actually made it as a rapper Right, he was well known in Canada. He was in the grass, you know, he had he would, he'd, he'd already been in the machine, right? He kind of had some kind of experience where so he built up some sort of calluses to the industry, so he was fine. But if you're just a regular schmegular kid and you've suddenly been thrust into a limelight and then you have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in the back pocket from a cash advance and you've got all these brands sending you free items and you invite all these crazy parties and all these girls in your DMs and it, it, it can can get a bit overwhelming and I can understand if you you know seek comfort in drugs and alcohol to kind of numb you a little bit and make you slow down and kind of live in a moment because things are just coming at you 100 miles per hour but it needs to be more people around them that can help them with it and to kind of put the blame on future is really really um irresponsible and short-sighted really because he's just an art he's just one guy those artists for the most part have a whole team around them that can advise them against doing those things but they don't of course the street stuff you know you can't really avoid that i think when you've got the mark on you from the streets you have it right you just kind of wait for your day to come but the things that can be avoided like the drugs overdose and stuff that's mostly due to the team that they have around them and it got me thinking about the professionalism that's needed to be a top artist of course like i mentioned not even could be drink but i think there is a lack of understanding of what it actually takes to be a star what it actually takes to be a working professional in the entertainment industry that's why for a long time i had a bit of a problem with you know arlie lennox always complaining on social about not you know about this part about this award show not giving her a prize about not getting this feature this magazine it just felt a little bit too entitled like you to just assume because you put out a good album and because you've been featured on pitchfork that suddenly everyone's meant to like bow down and kiss your feet that's not how it works right you're meant to continually keep working at your craft keep honing it getting better at moving at shaking hands kissing babies just being an artist 
and sometimes being an artist requires you to do things you don't want to do right going to a radio station in the middle of nowhere that's got you know 22 listeners because you just checked down in front quickly just so you can um keep that relationship sweet with the label for somebody else and if it's not even for you sometimes you're doing that for you doing that for another person coming after you or just to connect with that kind of an industry or connect with that audience these are things that you have to do just because you're an artist you might have to you know sleep in you might have to wake up a little bit earlier like the future said you might have to drink more water you might have to go to sound check and not just turn up for your performance loads of little things that will then affect the way you live your life right you can't necessarily go to the club and turn up you can't go to strip club you can't hang out with your friends long but those things I don't think are mentioned too often maybe because for the most part a lot of people can get away with just putting out something on SoundCloud getting a bit of heat from that performing at some club shows getting paid the odd you know 1500 3500 pounds five grand and it's suddenly a fine and you don't need to kind of like try that hard but I think if you're trying to make the next jump to real stardom you need to know that it is a job it's not it's not all fun and games it's not all kind of you know it's not just um it's not the scene that you would have fought from rolling loud every single day there is work involved and i think this interview here from dax j really spoke upon it if i can get up on here it's an old interview from dax j from resident advisor but i think it really is illuminating in terms of how to treat it like a job so i can find it um the, 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 see what it says, says I like da, 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 da. Da, da, da. let's back up here let's back up there here says it goes down chain music the weekend so I need to find it oh this is a good for playing DJ yeah he has uh mm. yeah here you go so the question to this is from Dax J kind of touches upon what Future said. It says here, so how do you deal with playing so much these days, right? From Resident Advisor, Dax J is one of the, you know, um, leading lights in the techno scene. Um, somebody that a lot of people have a lot of time for. I recommend you check out some of his productions. He's a really good dude. But the question here says, how do you deal with the playing so much these days? He answers, I don't drink at gigs anymore. The only time I part is in Berlin. When I'm on the plane, I like to work or read, which I can't do if I'm hungover. It's turned into the opposite of what I'd imagined DJ life to be like. While I was growing up, I thought I'd be like a rock star lifestyle, but it's complete opposite of what I envisioned. <laughs> I think I'm actually healthier than I would have been if I wasn't DJing. If I wasn't DJing, I'd be meeting up with friends and drinking, and which would lead to all sorts of stuff. So, which is interesting, right? Because I think when you're starting out, you would imagine, especially looking at these guys with their hands out wide, looking at a crowd, taking their shirt off, you know, doing all that stupid shit. You'd think, oh, okay, this person's getting on it 24-7. They're getting all these free drinks. They're sponsored by Bacardi. Got a Hennessy collab. You know, they're some rock boys. All this sort of shit. That's what you actually think. But if you look at some of their schedules, especially look at someone like a Solomon, right? You see how much that guy's flying around the world. You see how many gigs he's playing, actually. I'm actually kind of load up on here and see if I can get it. Uh, Solomon, all right. Mm, Reds and Advisor. You see how many gigs that Solomon's playing and stuff. It's just impossible for you to be drunk and hungover or even high all the time doing work in that kind of way that he works. <coughs> but again, it's, it's up to you what you want to do. I think for, the most, for most people, I think it's, it's the decision that they have to make as to kind of what kind of level they want to be at do you want to be at you know if you just want to be a kind of a local legend you probably can't get away with just playing you know three gigs a week um getting smashed doing it again next because you've got some days to recover but i think when you're flying different time zones different countries um the different timings as well you might play a festival during the day then you're doing another club gig then you're playing in after hours you might not even sleep literally for 24 hours so you look at someone like a song and of course these dates are uh, mostly cancelled due to the pandemic at the moment but just look at some of the dates and where he's at right he's at obviously he's um, residency at Ibiza then from there a week after he's going to Amsterdam then back again to Ibiza then over to Turin then back again to Ibiza then over to Amsterdam then back again to Ibiza then to Hungary then back again to Ibiza it's literally impossible to do that like you know drunk and high it just won't work the way that you imagine it to be and I think rappers are the same they need to kind of understand that you know as beneficial as it is to kind of you know turn up and have a good time in a club you kind of want to maintain some molecule of what do you say a profession of a professionalism and just maintain your health too your health as well is the most thing because 
for a lot of these guys, they tend to get better the older they get. The more sets and reps they get in, the more experience they have, the more they're able to develop their sound. They will obviously grow into a different artist than they started out to, but some of them, they don't even have the chance because they just get so wrapped up. They get so ingratiated in the rock star lifestyle that they forget that the actual, because that's the thing when you read some of these books, which probably they don't read, but they should, some of these all biography books from heavy metal bands, especially the ones that were, you know, popular in the 70s or no probably it's popular in the 70s and 80s yeah they're kind of like hair metal bands and you read what they were getting up to especially like the motley crew and shit like yeah fair enough they were you know they were probably garbage human beings at some point and they were probably doing too many drugs and were drinking way too much but the one thing you can't deny especially look at their, their discography they were putting out a lot of good music like it was solid back-to-back albums great live shows you know entertaining a crowd um of course you had the production of those shows was absolutely incredible it wasn't just some guy on a you know on a pair of uh midi dj controllers you know spinning behind them it was actual show where they flew in you know players drum players guitar players instrumentalists and stuff um and that was all kind of to elevate the show and give the, the fans a bit of an experience but the rappers don't do the same thing at all and then they expect those kind of rewards it's really kind of short-sighted really but again i really recommend you check it out um really cool interview with um future future the double xl magazine let me try to get up here again for you guys to see on the screen it is titled interview with future read the exclusive double xl interview about life is good oh yeah he announced his always new album is called life is good so you should be seeing that happening very very soon the club album with drake is probably going to be put on the back burner so it looks like that track that lead that was a lead single for his album i'm assuming it's going to rack up some numbers on that one and then probably drop the album later uh, later down the line so that's definitely keep an eye out for him with the album i really reckon i'm really excited to see what that ends up sounding like um what else do we have here Oh, they have this interesting video from Size actually previewing some trainers that are gonna pop out for April 2020. Go through some of these actually. I think this was actually a cool video that actually went through some shoes that I like. Um, Size has done really well over I think the last couple of years. Um, it feels as if they've made a concerted effort to bring in people that actually get the culture, who are actually about it. Um, they are doing collaborations that make sense. Um, again, Size are an interesting place because you know they're a uh nationwide retailer here in the uk if you're, if you're a us uh person you'll probably be aware of it if you buy sneakers who's what size are but they tend to rest in an interesting position where they supply the sneaker heads right people who are on crooked tongues who are on sneaker talk who are on you know, facebook groups on facebook groups about trainers online and then they also appeal to the regular schmegula joe schmo who happens to pass by carnaby street see a fancy shoe in the window and wants to cop it or you know a celebrity or a footballer all those kind of people so it's a really weird mix of people they have in the shop so their collaborations always i feel as if like they are in a hard spot with collab because they always have to feed both audiences because i would imagine even though they might get a lot of traction from the blogs about the shoes they put out the actual people that buy them are just regular folk they're the ones that probably keep the lights on and allow them to make yeah they, they keep the lights on week by week or day by day buying just you know converses and nike and vans old schools and you know um adidas stan smiths and shit those people probably keep the lights on because they just go there and just pick up the regular smuggler trainers and then the sneaker heads and people into shoes they just kind of you know keep things ticking over but you have to you have to satisfy both audiences and you have to also make a shoe that can appeal to that regular joe and also appeal to the kid that's leaving comments on hype um blog posts so it's a very interesting place to be but i think they do pretty well for all things considered and um this is kind of them highlighting some stuff that's going to be dropping in april 2020 so let's just skip ahead a little bit lower the sound so it's not too high let me see what they have available can you think of a better shoe that's come out this year than this it's hard so good isn't it? Lie to you. The new so that's the New Balance 992 made in USA. It's an absolutely beautiful shoe, great shape. I would say, from a sneakerhead point of view, I'd say probably the only shape that I'd prefer of this is probably the 991. I think it's a little bit better in terms of the sole. Obviously, the made in UK versions are a lot better. Some of the colorways you get are a lot better as well. But in terms of what they're offering for a for a size consumer, 
it's incredible you've got the quintessential um gray colorway you've got a nice sort of like tan mustardy colorway which you don't really see too often from retailers usually a thing that they do in terms of collaborations and then you've also got um the classic black upper with the white midsole shoe so really free um classic colorways and a really nice model that's very versatile can be worn in lots of different ways and just just nicely done really nothing too crazy on them 992 made in usa I mean, this is one of my favourites from the whole 99 series. Obviously, the series started in 1982. Yeah. Uh, the rumour is a certain Steve Jobs sent the design over to Mr. Davis, and then it kind, of, it kind of went from there. As with anything you get from Made in USA, the quality's there. It's definitely something you need to pick up and see because the quality of the suede, the new book and the materials on it, it's amazing. It's so so it's going to launch first with the original colour, and there's a few more colours coming through. We've actually got those here as well. When it comes to New Balance, I like that too. I like that New Balance are deciding to drop the original grey colorway, as I said, made famous by Steve Jobs, and then iterate all the other crazies later on. I think a lot of brands do that nowadays because they know, for the most part, you want to get the initial bump from sneakerheads, right? You want them to wear that shoe often, and then once people's eyes get used to that model and that silhouette, you then introduce all the nutty colorways out after that. Even Balenciaga did it with the triple S's. They put out some standard colorways and then just flooded the market with fluorescence and clear fruit, clear see-through soles and shit later on down the line. Bunch of new shoes, especially the 99 series. The gray is the one in it. It's also, I mean, these are brilliant, don't get me wrong, but this is the color, this yeah, is the, the color that's synonymous with so the brand. Nice. And uh, do you know what I mean? Like, like I said, I don't think there's going to be a better shoe this year. Or maybe one that we've done. But I remember last year when the V5 dropped, especially that grey one. I can't think of a shoe I wore more. We're also getting the 1300. The shoe originally was conceived in 1985. Nobody found it. I think the shoe mostly because of the toe box. I think when you're looking down them, wearing them, they sort of got this weird sort of like bulbous round shape. No matter how tight you tie your laces, they seem to kind of always kind of pop out around the sides. Um, I tend to think they probably suit people with smaller feet, I would say, from my experience. And then they have that weird sort of end cap thing that makes your foot go in as you're walking. It's sort of like a weird thing. I don't know how to describe it. It's sort of like a roll bar. Um, I don't find them comfortable at all, but, you know, it's a classic shape. Originally, it was... So I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit on that don't one. Feel the screen. Shoe. Start. So this is not one they got. Like we says. were working on, on an NPC and bringing it back, and it was back to front on the screen. And that started the thought process. When it comes to Reebok, we always look at it. Okay, a so shoe, this is, I think, it's similar to um, what what do they do? What did them garbs or do something like that? We do back to front, right? So this is a Reebok GL six 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 thousand, GL six thousand. Sorry, Reeboks I have no time for. I think I've said it before on here loads of times, but you know, I'm from a very sketchy part of East London where, for the most part, Reeboks are associated with NF, uh, <laughs> National Front, uh, BMP. Right, so they don't they don't really have a great um I have great memories of looking at Reebok or wearing Reeboks. It just feels as if like anyone that did wear Reebok that happened to be black was the kind of, you know, the bald headed sort of like cockney sort of sounding bloke that was, you know, a little bit whitewashed. No, it was a little bit of a coconut, sorry, it's whitewashed. Um yeah, so they don't necessarily have that appeal to me apart from obviously Reebok classics and workouts. But again, you know, there's so many shoes out there. I don't think I'm missing anything out of my repertoire by not wearing Reeboks. I've never worn them ever in my entire life. And this was even back in the day when the really popular ones were the kind of high top ones with the strap on them. That was all like the workouts. No, Reebok Classics with a strap on them. And then suddenly over, I don't know, the last 10 years, suddenly all the kind of artists, all the kind of wannabe contemporary artists from South London wear white ones with white socks and black trousers and you know dirty nails and shit. It become a little bit of a thing, but I don't think they look good. I've never felt they look good. I thought they're, they're probably one of the trashiest shoes out there. This Gel 6000 looks great as a model, but Reebok as a brand, I think they've misstepped so many times. The best thing they've probably done is the Metcons already. But apart from, not Metcons, um, the CrossFit shoes they had, they were not Metcons. Metcons are Nike, I forgot the one they had. But they were probably the best thing they did, and they kind of fumbled the ball in that one as well. So I'm just not really a fan, really. White shoe, whether it be a workout or a club seat or something like that, and we all do a really good premium iteration. We just wanted to kind of do a bit of a, a twist on that, a bit more storytelling. We're actually working on a classic vintage runner. It's the GL6000. And we thought, what better way to tell a story on it than to use one of the original colours? So the, essentially the back to front and the way that the factory is almost misinterpreted, the brief. You see it on the outside, it's really clean and that looks really premium, but you've got a little surprise. You see the real DNA of Reebok. So you'll see some of the details are changed and they're not what you expect. So the athlete shoe is usually the reverse of the label. 
that's on the okay, inside this time. Ooh, look, everything's kind of flipped. Tag, which usually on the inside of that tongue. There's, did Virgil get owed some royalties in that one? Everything's been flipped upside down, inside in. That's maybe a bit of a thing. They say it's because of what I've well, only got it through the screen, but this might be a Virgil owing of things, isn't it? But it does look interesting to look at, but again, not for me, so I'll just yeah, fast forward that see. one. Secrets. And then you've got another one well, here. What, what can we do in Easter? I mean, it was a weird conversation, I'll, I'll be honest with you. But we talk about Easter bunnies and stuff like that. And then we started talking about Easter eggs, the ones that are kind of hidden secrets within the shoe. It's themed on the Easter bunny. So you'll see the materials there really soft, hairy suede. This is pretty nice. It's actually, the model. Heel, the it's not my foam tongue. And it's just and it's in isolation. Too, so a really bit of nice love. looking shoe. How much are we going to give away? Yeah? I think we'll give two or three things away because there's a lot hidden on this shoe we actually said to the puma team when we actually finally briefed the shoe we want one thing yeah. hidden in the shoe or the box that even we don't know about we've That's been trying to cool. find them we've found about seven or eight things yeah. there's still more we've not seen what's underneath here yet i've come already am. <sighs> Should we just go in and let's see what we're going to do? So there's been a lot of this, isn't it? A lot of kind of cutaway. Maybe it's from the Jeff McFrederick era of Vandals, but there's been a lot of this sort of trend where collaborations are, um, where they have a an outer layer you can kind of peel away, a layer you can add stickers to or add Velcro badges to. You can burn, you can add it again. Again, I'm, I'm not too sure what the appeal of that sort of thing is about. I just quite like, you know, really well done colorways and great paneling and good material choices because I'm just like that classic look. But I guess some people want a bit of Larry stuff on their shoes. Not necessarily a thing for me. Um, I've seen it work really well with people kind of cinching the kind of reveal part, taking a lighter to it and burning some of the pieces away. But again, you know, I don't want to start being a, you know, I hate sneaker designers anyway. You know, the kind of people that replace panels with Python skin and shit. I think that stuff mostly looks garbage. So this kind of reminds me of that, and I don't necessarily want to do that. I want to buy the shoe and just wear it, and I don't want to have to kind of go home and start doing arts and crafts. But you know, like as I'm a model, it's pretty cool. Things. There's a lot of different. So he's that cutting now. away at There's the. There's a lot of different. Puma it, sign. Or what's happening? Okay, you've got a bit, some, bit of different. Form strikes changed. On the certain things. Turbi. Yes, it's what it is. Trans, but then again, it's on we the leave it as is. Actually, I think the colorway is actually quite nice. And then this, of course, the piece of resistance. Now I remember about a year ago, I was seen in Boston rummaging through one of the showrooms and finding a really early sample of this on the wall. As wow. you know, we're massive fans of the New Balance brand, and a lot of things we show you are archive projects, so stuff that we. So this is a three to seven uh, size exclusive, and I think uh, controversy. I would say I think this colorway doesn't really work that well for this model. I think this is a great example of colorway sort of ruining a model. I think if you saw the Casablancas that I might have talked about previously. They do a really good job of kind of accentuating some of the key features on that 327. Let's see if I can get up on here. Make a 327. And I think the colorway here that we've got at the moment from size doesn't necessarily do it for me. And that's the danger, I think, sometimes. That's probably the reason why a lot of these brands are doing collaborations with loads of bells and whistles because it's quite hard to do a simple collab and make it work. You need to add some other, you know, crazy accruements onto it to make it a thing. So if you see the difference between this colorway and that colorway, you've got the, obviously you've got the, with the Casablanca, you've got the addition of this sort of like two-tone midsole where they've sort of like got this off-white bit at the bottom and then a pure white in the middle. You've got this kind of perforated upper, um, nice plush sort of like new back uppers, uh, nice or new back paneling for the most part, and mudguard, and you've got this one here, even this, uh, let me look at this white one here actually. That one there looks pretty cool and classic, right? Really nicely done. And then you look at what they've done here with this one, it just looks a bit flat there's no real depth to it there's no feel no texture just a colorway that they kind of just look at something that you might design an id um again i'm sure it would do well for them but i just don't think it works well in that model i think it kind of that model calls for a few more classes and again maybe they couldn't do it because they already had an embargo on these sort of color schemes but the colorway that they have on there isn't the best i would say in my opinion but let's see what they have to say you know we're massive fans of the new Balance brand and a lot of things we show you are archive projects so stuff that we've seen over the last decades and we've brought it back they've used their archive to essentially create something brand new everything on this shoe is amplified and exaggerated and just how we like it so you'll see how aggressive the tooling is and again how overt the branding is as well it's got a real DNA of like a vintage kind of running shoe, something that you would have seen around in the 70s or early 80s. We wanted the shoe to do all the talking, yeah. so we've actually just used some of our favourite archive vintage running colours we've seen over the years. 
And there's actually a few little tweaks and changes, so we've made sure this. Yeah, it looks like the is LD100, isn't it? The other one before. That's like a Nike colorway shoe, and they're both probably Nike colorway shoes. I'm pretty sure. Well, as we've seen over the years. And there's actually a few little tweaks and changes, so we've made sure the spec of the materials is as you'd expect of a project probably from 40 years ago. Similarly, a lot of the inline versions have printed ends. We've actually put material on the ends okay, as well. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty cool to know that. I didn't know that. So inline's going to be printed, which is going to be weird, isn't it? What's that paneling on the side there? Is that mesh? A printed end on that might end up cracking a bit, and so I wonder how they're going to do that. Substantial. And again, like you saw on the Comp 100, it's actually got that size logo on the footbed as well. That's pretty cool. So we're going to round off this episode. But yeah, I think that will stop it there. I think the rest of it is some Adidas that I'm not really fond of. But yeah, um, a pretty cool video to see um, what's coming for April. I think what they mentioned here, loads of stuff coming in. They're going to drop. I'm assuming that'll be a little bit of good rest by people that, you know, suffering from a pandemic, have a little bit of a silver lining in your day by buying some new trainers. So definitely check out that video. I'll put it in the show notes again for you guys to watch for yourselves. Anyway, that's an hour. Thanks so much for tuning in to Axiom Zinga Show, episode number 299. As per usual, find out more information regarding myself. Check out my website, axiomzinga.com, for more information regarding myself. You can find links to my socials and all that malarkey. Make sure you click follow and all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Take care. Bye.